Hello, and welcome to our Sierra Week Agora conversation presented by IHS Market. Title, New Frontiers for Ocean Innovation. As this is perhaps a bit of an enigmatic title, let me provide some additional background to explain the topic in a, with a few more details. So when we look at the ocean um, and we look at the offshore, it's not just oil and gas exploration production, but we also see the rise of alternative forms of energy sources like wind, solar, or wave. Um, the emergence of deep sea mining that help provide the materials for the energy transition, and they all will draw upon the ocean environment. This is by going further offshore, going into deeper waters. In this conversation, we will explore the technical and non-technical aspects of the increasing use of our ocean environments. And in order to do that, I'm joined by an excellent panel to answer many of these questions around this topic. Um, first of all, there's Garrett Davis, who is the Executive Director of Strategy and Technology for Oilfield Equipment with Baker Hughes. Then we have Jennifer McCann, who is the Director of US Coastal Programs for the Coastal Resource Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant at the University of Rhode Island. I hope I got that right, Jennifer. You did, thank you. And then um, finally, last but not least, there's Ruth Perry, who is the Business Environment Advisor at Shell Renewables and Energy Solutions. So, Thank you all for being here, first of all. And I, I did um, ask you to prepare a little of an opening question that shows a, a bit of the personal developments from the last year. As you know, we had this big pandemic. You couldn't have missed it. And I'm sure that um, that really impacted your daily life. And apart from working remotely, not being able to interact with your direct colleagues and being perhaps locked up in your home, like we have here in the Netherlands um, for um, almost a year, um, what was the impact on your personal life? And Ruth, I want to start with you. Great, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to join the conversation today. Um, Shell's purpose is to power progress together by providing more and cleaner energy solutions, including energy solutions that are extracted from our oceans. Respecting nature, protecting the environment, and making a positive contribution to biodiversity are part of Shell's powering progress strategy, which we have been rolling out over the past couple of years as it relates to energy transition. Safe and responsible operations in the ocean environment, utilizing public-private partnerships, which means partners from government, academia, and industry will be the focus of my remarks today and look forward to exploring the technical and non-technical aspects of this topic. Specific to your question on the COVID-19 pandemic, as it relates to our ocean partnerships and my personal life as an oceanographer on the ground with many of our projects has really been the inability to collaborate in person. We work alongside our government and academic partners and with the pandemic, we had to quickly adapt to the remote working environment. This included at home, but also at sea because we deploy quite a bit of autonomous technologies to monitor hurricanes, for instance. And so we had to find ways to get people safely to vessels so that they were healthy um, and that they didn't have a risk of COVID exposure. So we could deploy equipment that was critical to monitoring the ocean environment during you know, key times such as hurricane season, which were almost toward the end of, but not quite out yet. And as we know, it's been an active hurricane season. Um, so, you know, as a group, we were able to come together and quickly overcome these challenges safely, um, but the remote aspects have certainly made it difficult to come together, brainstorm, draft, and execute large-scale partnership opportunities, especially in offshore wind with ocean monitoring that we would normally do in workshops with each other um, in one to two day workshops involving collaborators, both at the national level, global level, and across um, academia, government, and industry, such as some of the work that Jen and I are working on with Offshore Wind, we've had to find new ways to adapt um, to doing things that we would normally do in person. So I think that's been our, our biggest challenge as it relates to the pandemic and specifically to ocean partnerships. Thank you. And you already alluded to a bit of the technology side when you mentioned autonomous vehicles. So um, mm -hmm. Jennifer, same question for you, sure. actually, you, your impact on your life. 
Great, thank you, Oscar. And um, thanks for this opportunity, I really appreciate it. So yeah, so I'm um, here at the University of Rhode Island. We're having a Nor'easter today. And uh, when people ask me what we do here at URI and Rhode Island Sea Grant, is our job is to work with um, our coastal and ocean stakeholders, whether they be the fishing community, the offshore wind energy community, um, municipalities, um, government at all levels, to make our coasts and oceans a better place to live, work, and play. And we do that by serving as an honest broker of information and ensuring that um, the best available science and best management practices are um, shared and integrated and, and um, so that the best decisions are made. And um, as far as uh, COVID is, you know, I, I never realized I really miss interacting with people and, and, you know, you can have a meeting, a virtual meeting, but what I realized is, you know, so much gets done before and after a meeting, you know, asking people about their families and building that trust um, that's really necessary as we're innovating and finding these difficult solutions to these critical problems that we're facing. Um, so that was a challenge for me. We got a dog um, as well. So that was sort of my, we have two dogs now. So that was my, those were my work buddies. Um, the, the, the neat thing that I really enjoyed though is I had so many people from around the world in my house virtually. So when we would have, you know, usually if we had a public meeting in Rhode Island, maybe we would get a hundred people on a good day, mostly from the Northeast. Um, we were organizing webinars all the time, bringing in international experts, people from the Netherlands or Germany or Japan to talk about, um, to talk with our, whether it be our local communities or fishermen, and, and we were able to have these interactive conversations virtually. Again, it wasn't in person, but we were able to sort of share expertise globally and, um, and learn from, um, from people around the world on these critical issues. So that was a positive. We had, we interacted with thousands of people over the past couple of years, whereas on a normal year, it may have been hundreds. So um, to some degree, that was a positive um, aspect of it. But again, you can't, I, I really miss interacting with people and really connecting um, and, and moving things forward in that way. Okay, thank you. Um. I made a, a few notes, so we'll probably come back to some of the aspects that you mentioned here. Uh, Garrett, over to you. Um. Thanks, thanks, Oscar. Um, yeah, pleased, pleased to also be here. Um, I think for, for Baker and, and specifically within the subsea area, um, the, the COVID sort of shutdown provided a, a poignant sort of moment to reflect on where we were and the business practices that we were involved with within our subsea business particularly that's forced us to think about how we're able enabling the the transition towards the the gas um you know provided energy and it's also made us think a lot more about things like traveling to the office and and our own carbon footprints i think one of the things that's come out of this which is an amazing personal flexibility that probably wouldn't have been considered just a few years ago um, so I think as, as individuals, as people, we've all grown that flexibility, which is great. Um, but as a business, it's really focused us on enabling the, the sort of gas or wide scale gas adoption um, and how we can become as a business more efficient and, and reduce that carbon footprint. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, flexibility was definitely a key aspect that we all, uh, all experienced. Um, with perhaps also for, for all three of you uh, here, uh, different time zones. The, the joke that, we, that I had a little bit was, you know, in the past you had maybe two or three time zones in a week. Now you have five, five time zones in a day. So, um, uh, but Garrett, I, wa I want to stay with you and, and um, basically go back to, or, you know, go further in the topic of subsea. So we, when you talk about this, this ocean exploration and, you know, the, the use of the ocean, um, subsea is playing an increasingly greater role. Can you perhaps highlight it a little bit further? 
Yeah, sure. So um, we've spent a lot of our time looking at how we become more efficient. And part of that is making sure that the sort of bigger greenfield projects that we've historically been involved in are, are really game changing from a payback perspective. But a lot of the projects that we seem to be involved in now going forward are a sort of infill projects or um, projects associated with maximizing the return on, on an investment that's already been made. So what as otherwise called as brownfield enhancement projects. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can help our customers to um, to, to enhance those returns, um, particularly around things like compression, pumping and boosting, which allow particularly the sort of deeper water and the longer offset projects to become more viable, um, particularly within tie-in distance of, of already installed assets as well. Okay, thanks. And, and then, Ruth, I want to move over to you as, you know, as, as a leading operator in this domain, but also expanding into the you know, the, the new energies, let's call them that, and, you know, we mentioned solar, wind, uh, and also what you call them, by the way. Um, so, Ruth, if, if, we, if we look at, you know, Shell or the operator, not perhaps particularly Shell, but the operator area domain. Um, and so what do you see when you're moving to the seafloor? What are some of your experiences? Well, it's interesting with uh, Shell Renewable and Energy Solutions, particularly offshore wind, because we're actually moving back into shallower waters. So, you know, Shell Gulf of Mexico, um, a few years ago, had our 40th year anniversary of working in the deep and ultra deep Gulf of Mexico. And offshore wind is actually working in 30 to 60 meters of water. So we're moving, you know, back in for offshore wind, but eventually that's going to move offshore as well into the deeper waters with floating technologies, which are being looked at in both the Gulf of Mexico, California, and the East Coast, such as Maine. And so we're going to see that progression of technology, and that's really exciting for us as an engineering company as well, um, because we really pioneered uh, deep water exploration and production for oil and gas, and we see a leading role as well for the offshore wind industry. And what's unique, I think, about the offshore wind industry that people don't realize in the United States is it's very data intensive up front. So the site characterization, the seafloor mapping, uh, the geophysical survey work, as well as the geological coring that we're doing is all done up front in the permitting process. So we're generating a lot of data and information about seafloor and the habitats of those seafloors and the areas that we're working, which can really supplement a number of efforts that are happening at the government level, but also really inform resource management for a lot of the areas that Jen highlighted, such as fisheries, benthic communities, and other marine resources. Um, and so we're actually utilizing lessons learned from our partnerships in the oil and gas side with data sharing, with all of this information being collected how do we integrate that into government data systems very early so that it can be accessible to the public, it can be accessible to researchers so that they can use it to inform ocean resource management, they can um, inform models and other types of scientific research that's going on. And so we're really trying to establish this kind of two-way street between our efforts working in the ocean and our partners' efforts as well, so that we really understand uh, the environments that we're operating in. Thanks, and mm -hmm. yeah, Jen, I, I, I think you, you can feel that I'm moving towards you when, when talking about partnerships, you know, private-public uh, uh, partnerships, um, and, and you mentioning that, you know, basically your institute is an information broker, so maybe you want to respond to, to this one. Sure. And, and again, just to, I, I'd like to build off of what Ruth was saying, because, uh, I, you know, I think, um, you know, clearly with offshore wind energy and other sorts of large uh, offshore development, there, there is that need of, of data collection and, um, and government and resource users can't afford to go and do all of this research. So the, 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 the opportunities for um, industry to, again, share that knowledge and expertise with others so that uh, good decisions can be made um, are, are really um, 
it's something we really need to do and, and foster. Um, it also um, creates a, a, a sharing of, you know, and collaboration, which, um, you know, and so at times would minimize conflict. Um, so um, we're all sort of listen, we're all um, on the same page and we're, we're all, we all have the same um, scientific or technical information to again, um, try to minimize conflict. Um, I also know, for example, um, Orsted, which is another developer, has asked URI to help them explore the idea of, of multi-use. So identifying technologies or solutions to um, create synergistic relationships between um, different resource users. So you may know Rhode Island is um, our claim to fame in this is we have the, the first offshore wind energy um, wind farm here off of our coast, the Block Island Wind Farm. And Orsted has asked the university to look at, are we able to um, synergistically promote um, muscle harvesting off the turbines with offshore wind energy. So with that, we're creating um, partnerships and economic um, incentives as well as, you know, um, potentially enhancing the natural environment. Um, and uh, so, so we're all benefiting or more are benefiting and conflict is reduced. Uh, and that's a really interesting point to harvest mussels from the uh, from, from the poles of these uh, these wind turbines. And um, yeah, I, I can see that I'm being you know positioned close to the North Sea. That that would be something that uh, could could thrive here too. Um, just going back to the technology before we dive a little bit deeper into these partnerships. So Garrett, one of the things we see, and and maybe you know afterwards I'll, I'll come back to you, uh, Ruth and and Jennifer, but Electricity is one of the key words, of course. It's one of, you know, if you look at the energy transition, electricity, electrons are sort of the motor behind that. Um, at the same time, you know, offshore wind parks, offshore solar um, is being used to, uh, um, uh, being, you know, is generating electricity. So that's, that's, that's the key element of this energy transition. At the same time, we see operations in the offshore electrification playing a much greater role there. Um, Garrett, do you want to highlight a bit how that's, you know, when you look at your work at Baker Hughes, how that's changing, basic, perhaps the, the way you operate? Yeah, so we're, we're involved in a number of projects at the moment, looking at how we electrify the subsea infrastructure surrounding um, our traditional business. And um, it's an interesting reference, actually, to Bill Gates's book that, that I read recently on, on the energy transition. And the first thing he says is electrify everything that we can electrify. Um, it's an interesting sort of dichotomy when you look at electrification of, of subsea oil and gas generating assets effectively. But I think the point is is pretty sound anyway. Um, we're looking at systems that allow us to lower the footprints that we're installing subsea. Um, and obviously that's got an economic benefit in terms of um, the financial investment with things like umbilicals to, to transport to and from. Um, the subsea assets. And, and the second thing is the fact that obviously it's going to cost less. So um, in terms of where we're moving, um, we're also trying to look at how we, you know, only transport as much fluid back to the surface as is the useful fluid. And anything that can be considered a byproduct, we will process subsea um, and try and either store or re-inject depending on the system that's in place. So we've done carbon re-injection um, with some customers um, globally, um, one in North Sea and one in, in Australia. Um, and also we need to think about how we're you know, doing that going forward to, to really optimize the transportation as well. Thanks. Um, and now, Ruth, I, I, I want to go back to you. As, you know, as, as we've seen, I mean, we notice in ISIS markets the same trends where we see a lot of happening towards the sub the subsea. Yeah, to, to, to the sea floor. So as Garrett just mentioned, I mean, it may be processing, it may be, um, you know, um, some things had to, to reduce surface carbon footprints. Um, subsea tiebacks, Garrett already mentioned that. I know Shell's active in that, but you're an environmental advisor. How does that work? I mean, how do you look at the, the, the sea floor environment? I mean, the land environment is pretty obvious because we live there, so we can all see it. Subsea is a bit 
you know, in that sense, a bit more hidden. I mean, mm -hmm. can you sort of enlighten us a bit here? Yeah, thanks, Oscar. And, and Gareth did a great job. You know, we're looking at a lot of the same technologies when we're talking about subsea uh, exploration and production. Um, but I work in the entire water column, you know, from a, even above the surface down to 3,000 meters plus with um, the environmental side and a lot of my colleagues at Shell. And so we're really having to help our businesses understand what potential communities may be down there, what species may be around our operations, and how can we minimize any risk to those species and habitats from our operations. As you know, uh, Oscar, much of this is regulated, but also quite a bit it falls under the commitment I talked earlier where we want to respect the biodiversity and have safe and responsible operations in these environments. And so we're trying to utilize actually across existing operations we're doing. And I'll give one example of that. Um, monitoring the deep sea is very difficult for a lot of our government and academic researchers because we're working in areas that are very expensive to get to and it requires very uh, specialized equipment to access, including deep sea ROVs and the vessels that go with all that equipment as Garrett, Gareth and I well know. Um, but academic researchers don't have the ability to, to get to the same levels of equipment and access that we have. So we're trying to find ways where we can open up the deep sea um, in the areas in which we're operating to those partners. And so for instance, um, our ROV footage, we provide to um, biological researchers, such as Louisiana State University, to look at the biodiversity that they see around our structures, as well as they see on the seafloor. So that data sharing serves both a technical purpose, but it also serves a biological purpose in documenting the biodiversity and showing our regulators what we're finding and how we're minimizing any potential impacts. And so it's kind of, it's finding that dual purpose to the data sharing where we can um, both ensure that our operations are safe to the habitats and species that, we're, um, that are in the area where we may be working, providing that data to researchers so that they can better understand and document what's in those environments. And then that all comes full circle back into the resource management of sensitive areas and habitats and species. And so we really see it as this kind of connectivity where we have to be able and be willing to share the data and information because that makes better well-informed decisions, both from a technical side, from the company perspective, but also as a government regulator and a resource manager, having access to information that they otherwise wouldn't have, has we have seen results in positive uh, decision-making around all sides. So that's kind of one example. There's certainly many others. Um, and as technology evolves in our company, we're bringing in more of our academic researchers to either help us enable those technologies or to find other ways that we can utilize those technologies to supplement our environmental work as well. Yeah. That's a pretty clear answer. And it also is a nice introduction to my question to Jennifer, namely, is this the future where, you know, if we're moving into this much more hostile, much more inaccessible environment that these partnerships or where, you know, in this case, you know, uh, Shell provides the environmental, let's say, infrastructure in the form of, you know, autonomous underwater vehicles or ROVs, you know, remotely operated vehicles the less technical experts in the audience. Um, is, that, is that the way forward, these partnerships and basically um, because it is such an inaccessible environment? It's, it's really necessary. And uh, for an, another example, so in Rhode Island, we have a, one of our, our largest uh, blue economy sectors is the defense industry. And um, I'm right across the bay is um you know the navy war college and um and 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 lots of uh the defense industry is expanding and, and it's within the northeast but rhode island has a has a significant amount of 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 the defense industry and um they have we have strong mous and partnerships with um with the defense industry at uri here because 
and, and, and the defense industry is also working more closely with the private sector because they're realizing that the investment, like Ruth was talking about, it's the private sector that's got a lot of money to invest in uh, research and development, which then the defense industry can also um, then use and take advantage of. Um, and then the, again, the defense industry wants to work with the university because we're for many reasons, we can be more, we can be creative and innovative. We can also bring and build the capacity of the next, uh, of the workforce. Um, it, and that's at, at times critical. I, according to the defense industry here, they can't hire enough qualified ocean engineers and oceanographers um, to meet their needs. So this partnership of bringing the strengths of each sector um, to the table to respond to these wicked issues. Um, you know, I was just listening and we, we know this, that, you know, one of our biggest, um, uh, biggest issues obviously is coastal resilience and sea level rise. And the mm -hmm. defense industry is recognizing that this is critical. This is, this is globally a, a, an issue that they need to respond to. Well, who has worked in coastal and climate mitigation and responding um, using soft infrastructure as well as hard infrastructure? Well, it's academic institutions, it's consultants, it's private sector. And so responding to these ocean and coastal issues uh, requires partnerships um, so that again we can create these synergies um, to create to find uh, creative solutions. So the, the future is not only exciting from a technical perspective, technology perspective, but also from a non-technology. If I listen to these partnerships, I mean we started out with you know the traditional oil field operators who with their suppliers like Baker who are expanding into the renewable space, but now we're bringing the defense, uh, the defense industry also here. So, and and um, I, I, I will say too, that they, we, we, again, we pull in our students as much as we can on these projects because they look at things so differently. Mm -hmm. They were, they've been brought up differently um, than, than we have in fact, and I'm still young. So, but, but anyway, so, so it's, it's bringing the seasoned professionals with the young energetic um, students who, who look at things differently. This, these are sort of, these are the partnerships and innovations that we need to nurture globally. It, it, it's, it's great how you each time give me nice setups to go to the next person. <laughs> So I want to move over to Garrett because um, talking about young people, one of the things that we clearly see is that they've been brought up, you know, in this, let's say, digital, um, digital environment, digital age. And um, at the same time, we heard from all three of you that data plays a major role in this system. Thinking of Baker Hughes and maybe, you know, a bit of the, the alliance they have with C3AI. AI. Um, so how, when you talk about data digitalization, is next to energy transition, is that in this domain, another key, let's say, element, when you talk about the subsea developments, but also, you know, I'll turn to you, Ruth, in a moment, but, you know, digitalization data, is this, is this playing, you know, the critical role to make this all work, perhaps? Yeah, so the, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we're looking at a huge amount of data enablement projects for our subsea assets in particular. Um, the, the key thing around op some optimizing our production and our is is a collective word for you know our customers as well as our, as our own assets. But um, the, the data is what is providing us with better decision making ability. So if you think about um, how we get from effectively quite an inefficient system where we were maybe a decade or, or two ago to the future place then, it's definitely, you know, something that's enabled by better data and better decision making. Um, and, and going back to the defense industry, which is a place I used to work as well, what, one of the greatest fears for, for the defense industry in some areas is taking the man out of the loop of the decision making. Uh, and I think that's got a huge amount of read across in terms of the oil and gas industry, particularly around things like autonomous production of the oil field. Um, when we think about where we are in that sort of trust and return paradigm, then we're probably right at the bottom of that staircase. And, you know, we've got things like in parallel system running, we've got to learn and trust the environments that we're in before we can get up the, the staircase to things like machine learning and, and recommended decision making. 
Um, and then there's a good amount of trust and, and in parallel system running with things like digital twin before we can get up to things like autonomous operations. Mm. So, you know, I think it, there's not really a huge difference between how you autonomize a production environment. And I don't think it matters particularly, obviously there's different inputs and outputs, but there's a lot to be learned between what we're doing in oil and gas, what we're doing with C3, um, and what other people are doing in renewables. And, and the things probably aren't too dissimilar in terms of the outcomes that they're going to reach and the decision-making processes that they're going to follow. Mm-hmm. Ruth, I, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, um, answer, uh, um, sort of comment on, on Garrett's remarks here. On the other hand, I do have another question. <laughs> and we're running a bit, you know, of, as I would expect with this interesting topic towards the end of, um, um, you know, the session here, the conversation here. So, um, just a, a brief comment, and then uh, perhaps we can take one more question. Um. Yeah, I'll be brief, Oscar. Um, and I'll just cover the environmental side, because um, Gareth certainly covered the operational perspective. But as we move to these autonomous technologies, the rate of data that we receive is exponential as well. And so how to translate that into actual information and then decision making. So when we look at it from um, the environmental side, I'm an observationalist. That's how I was raised as a scientist. But we also have the modeling and prediction side. And those are very important to when we start looking at and assessing the potential uh, effects of these projects, such as the renewable energy industry on the environment. Um, And so the ability to visualize and synthesize data is an entirely different skill than even I was trained on. And like Jen, I still consider myself young. And so it's really gonna be um, kind of the non-traditional scientist and more of these kind of data integration mindsets that can look across multiple data sets and turn that into information. Um, Because data that we get off these technologies is just that. But translating it into meaning is a whole different skill set. And we're seeing that across all of the industry, the energy industry, whether that's renewables to seafloor mapping to engineering. And so it is really exciting, but Gareth still raises, I think we're on the early cusp of it. Um, And then how can we utilize the information and combine it with other information such as what we're seeing in the environment? Um, This discussion comes up often in the climate space. Um, is how do we look at trends and discern those between, you know, short-term local effects to longer-term regional or global effects. That's all in how data is interpreted and manipulated and modeled, and how do we use that to make better decisions and predict what may happen in the future. So it's certainly an exciting space, um, but it is going to be a very critical space as I think any ocean use moves forward, particularly the energy side. Okay, and I, I wanna keep you, but maybe Jen, give you the opportunity to respond. So there's one topic that we haven't addressed and, and maybe you can give a bit of a short answer here, but it's policy and regulations. I mean, we <laughs> talked about the technology, digitalization, um, subsea, but you know, at the other hand, there's you know government, which is on, sometimes imposes things and sometimes you know, really supports things. Um, Jen, you're you're on the academic side. Policy and regulation, is there sufficient in place? Is it progressing sufficiently? Or is the industry, for instance, moving too fast in these offshore domains at the moment? Uh, So that's a a long question. But I, I guess just very briefly, I would encourage our regulatory system to promote more Um, multi-use, more synergistic relationships. Right now, my understanding is if you want to, um, you know, if you want to offshore wind energy and aquaculture uh, at the same time, you need two permits and it's two processes, for example. My understanding in the Netherlands, it's different that the government is actually promoting multi-use and synergistic Mm -hmm. relationships. Um, so, So it's not, I'm not, suggesting something that's 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 not real um so also at least in in the united states you know um 
a lot of people we we have the people have a right to their opinion we should be using our coasts and oceans for the uh the public good and um we have a public trust doctrine which which supports that and you know that includes um and and so we need to make sure that um, people who are part of the conversation, the decision making, you know, have are informed and also have an opportunity to share their own expertise and their knowledge, um, whether it be the tribes who, um, you know, look at things um, from a different perspective. And that's why um, URI does a lot of work with paleocultural landscaping and, and bringing anthropologists and tribal mm -hmm. representatives to understand what are the changes so that we can make better decisions for the future? Um, so I would say, uh, again, that our regulate regulation, our policy should encourage more synergist synergy, you know, smart growth on the water. Basically, we do it on land. Let's try to do it in the water. It's a very crowded place. And also to really um, um, fund technologies um, so that we are minimizing the effects of this um, future development on not only our wildlife, but also um, existing activities. Could we invest in um, different gear types and, um, and, and fishing vessels, for example, or navigational structures so that fishing can happen, can take place more safely in the growing offshore wind energy um, industry? Could we promote aquaculture in a way that is economically valuable? I don't have these answers, but I do know that we need to take time and think about these things so that um, decisions are being, you know, that offshore renewable energy or future efforts are really in the long term responding to um, the needs of, of everyone. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's great that we could touch on this topic. I'm sure it will be continued in the actual Zero Week conference. Um, I am about to round off here, but I want to give you, starting with Garrett, one final question. You only get like 10 words or, or maybe 15 to answer. <laughs> We're a bit stressed for time here. But, and the key question that I, I, I always like to ask, you know, if you would look five or 10 years back, you know, what would be the, the, the sort of game changing breakthrough technology that we think, oh, that really changed it, this, this you know, looking at these offshore environments? Garrett, if you have uh, to pick one. I think it was still in its infancy at the time, but I think electrification is the thing that, you know, looking from a 10 year perspective, looking forward, it would be electrification. Okay, great. Ruth. Um, I'm going to go with autonomous surface and subsurface vehicles that have integrated monitoring, both from the engineering and development all the way to the environmental side. I think that started on the cusp five to 10 years ago and partnerships will help us to scale those um, and utilize those technologies. Okay, thanks, great. So we have electrification, autonomous vehicles and Jennifer, for you the last uh, opportunity to answer here. So I'm gonna say a non-technological thing. I think we need to make sure that people are still and, and knowledge, local knowledge is part of it, you know, in the past, it's been part of the decision making process and it needs to be um, part of the of the decision making process and integrated in all aspects of science. Okay. Um, I, thank you with that. I think we're um, we're definitely over the over our time, but um, it's been a great conversation. So thank you all very much. Um, and this has been a Sierra Week Agora conversation. Thank you for the audience for joining us today. And we look forward to um, seeing you all in person at Sierra Week 2022, which is in March in Houston. So thank you and um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.